Good. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us from across the region. I wish to acknowledge the Honorable Ambassador Dr. June Suma, Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States, representatives from the Office of the Prime Minister and Office of the Cabinet, Jamaica, representatives from the Caribbean Development Bank, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the United Nations Development Program, and the Caribbean Mail Action Network and the Caribbean Policy Research Institute. Also representatives from the Bureau of Standards Jamaica, the Bureau of Gender Affairs Jamaica, the Planning Institute of Jamaica, the Child Protection and Family Services Agency, and the Jamaica Council of Churches. Also representatives from local, regional, and international universities and from local, regional, and international NGOs, representatives from the private sector, and also the Mona and University Director of the Salises, Professor Aldry Henry Lee. Unfortunately, both Professor Dale Webb, Principal of Mona Campus of the UWI, and Professor David Tennant, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at Mona, have other engagements and will be unable to join us. I therefore tender apologies on their behalf. This evening, under the auspices of the Salisa Social Policy Research Cluster, and as part of the observance of the Mona Campus Faculty of Social Sciences at 60, we explore the topic, when we love and hurt intimate partner violence in the Caribbean. We examine this topic with four distinguished panelists representing academia, the state public policy sector, the NGO sector, and from the discipline of clinical psychology. The panelists are Dr. Delia Bean, Dr. Corin Bailey, Mrs. Sharon Coburn Robinson, and Dr. Peter Weller, whom I will properly introduce prior to their individual presentations. My name is Heather Ricketts, and I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator. Intimate partner violence, defined as physical, sexual, emotional, and economic violence perpetrated by one sexual partner on the other, who may or may not be living in the same household, is an intractable problem. It is not quite the same as domestic violence, which is defined as violence occurring between any two people in a household. According to Said and Bartels Bland writing in 2020, IPV, which is intimate partner violence is, and I quote, one of the most widespread and persistent human rights issues in the world, which remains largely underreported due to the impunity stigma and shame surrounding it." End quote. IPV is also deemed to be a serious public health challenge. And in the present context of the COVID-19 pandemic and what appears to be the worsening of the problem, um, certainly in terms of the increase in the number of reports, some writers are describing it as the shadow pandemic. Over the past few weeks, we have been in Jamaica uh, seeing what appears to be an avalanche of public reports of horrific incidents of intimate partner violence and domestic violence. Even one of the incidents has allegedly been perpetrated by one of our parliamentarians. According to Watson Williams writing in 2018, the author of the 2016 Women's Health Survey Jamaica report, more than one in four women in Jamaica has experienced IPV in their lifetime, either physical or sexual or both. One in four women has experienced physical violence alone with the perpetrator being a male and one in five has experienced severe violence. Earlier studies by Lefranc et al in 2008 reported a lifetime physical violence prevalence rate of 45% for Jamaican women. According to the Bureau of Gender Affairs in Jamaica, 
this high incidence of IPV and domestic violence is a major stumbling block to the attainment of SDG 5 gender equality and to women's empowerment and by extension to national development. Jamaica is not unique, however. Said and Bartels bland in noting results of national surveys conducted between 2016 and 2019 in Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, and Tr Trinidad and Tobago conclude, quote, that violence against women is endemic, end quote. The lifetime prevalence rates of intimate partner violence range from a low of 39% in Grenada and Jamaica to a high of 48% in Suriname. The rate for Trinidad and Tobago is 44%. These are high rates. My colleague, Dr. Sharon Priestley, in her 2014 publication, The Prevalence and Correlates of Intimate Partner Violence in Jamaica, in which she reported results of her logistic regression analysis, found that young age, that is under the age of 35 years, poverty, and having a controlling partner, quote, consistently increased the likelihood of exposure to all forms of IPV, with control being the strongest, end of quote. Other associative factors which she found were low-level education, being involved in a common law relationship, and early life exposure to violence. Writing with Lee in 2019, Priestley in their exploration of the factors which contributed to young males, these are now 15 to 24 years, to their violence against their partners, found that male control was the most important factor. Professor Patricia Anderson, in her just published 2021 book, Masculinity and Fathering in Jamaica, documents how macho values based on quote, sexual dominance and virility and procreative need, end quote, dictate attitudes towards women. Her work based on four communities in Jamaica, distinguished by social class, found that in the inner city and semi-rural communities, there was much higher percentage agreement that, quote, a man has the right to physically dis discipline his partner if she steps out of line end quote. So that was higher in those communities than in the middle and working class communities. But on average, across all uh, the communities, and that would be now across all socioeconomic classes, 51% of all men interviewed had admitted to hitting a woman in their lifetime. This percentage was substantially higher in the inner city community at 73%, where the men were young, like under the age of 35, 58% of them admitted to this, and the men with secondary education up to grade nine, 60% of, of, of them. So having provided this simple framing of the problem of IPV, which is a very complex issue, I want to now introduce our first panelist, Dr. Dahlia Bean, who will provide a historical analysis showing the historical roots of IPV and ascertaining how attitudes have evolved. Let me tell you a little of Dr. Bean. So Dr. Bean is a lecturer and graduate coordinator at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies Regional Coordinating Office at the UWA. She has researched extensively in the areas of women and gender justice in, the, in Caribbean history, sorry, women in conflict situations and gender relations in the Caribbean hotel industry. She's the author of the book, Jamaican Women and the World Wars on the Front Lines of Change, a book was published in 2017. Let me now invite Dr. Bean to address us. Thank you so much, Dr. Rick, for that important framing and kind introduction and good evening to all our guests on this evening. Now, the title of my presentation is Looking Back to Move Forward, What History Tells Us About GBV and IPV in Jamaica. I, um, as Dr. Rickett said, I am a gender specialist, but at heart, I am a historian. 
and I am using my history lens to give us a kind of understanding of why we are where we are and to also contextualize some of the issues that the other panelists will look at shortly. Now, why look back? Especially, of course, with the understanding that we are here in a Salises Forum, which generally focuses on contemporary issues and policy formation. And for me, history, um, and in particular, the idea of Sankofa, symbolizes Akan people's quest for knowledge with the implication that the quest is based on critical examination and intelligent investigation. In this conceptualization, it is in learning from the past which ensures a strong future. My overarching argument and actually a larger project of history, historical analysis which, analysis, which I'm undertaking, is therefore to say that we have not sufficiently learned from the past relating to gender-based violence and intimate partner violence to contextualize contemporary cultures of violence which we are now experiencing. And so what I hope to do in these short um, few minutes is a gender justice and co for where we're going back to get it in order to reset it and in order to move forward into a better reality. Now, um, based on my research, what we have um, found is that the plantation economy's secret weapon was gender-based violence and intimate partner violence. And we could, of course, start from before the period of enslavement, but it is um, a very short time in which I have to do this. So I have chosen to start at this point. Enslaved people's realities were shaped by endemic and systematic inequities that made them particularly vulnerable to gender specific abuses. So for instance, um, Clinton Hutton's work, including gallification of man and others, gives us a peek into the sexualized torture and abuse meted out to black men by white enslavers in order to strip them of their masculinity and undermine their assumed or real sexual prowess. Um, and here we have an image um, which is said to be um, depicting this where black men would be repeatedly hit on the buttocks before being raped by some of these um, enslavers, overseers and so on. Also, and perhaps what we know a little bit more about is that contrary to prevailing though contested European value systems, which held women as weaker than men and in need of care and protection, enslaved women were abused with all the strength and vigor that the plantation economy could muster. And we hear in her own words, Mary Prince giving us account of one, of, of one such example. Here she's speaking about an overseer and she says, after abusing me with every ill name he could think of and giving me several hard blows with his hand, he said, I shall come around tomorrow morning at 12 on purpose to give you around 100, in this case, 100 lashes. He kept his word. He tied me up on a ladder. Benji stood to count them for him. And when he got weary, he rested. Then he beat me again. An earthquake interrupted and in the confusion, I crawled away, my body, all blood and bruises. So therefore the power exalted over colonial, colonized peoples by enslavers was not only for monetary gain and political status, which we are accustomed to knowing, but also included rights to abuse and to sexual access to those considered to be subordinate. Some of us may know of Thomas Thistlewood, who was an estate manager and enslaver who lived in Jamaica in the 1700s. And his journal entries are replete with references of largely non-consensual sexual access that he had to enslaved women under his administration. Now, what we find as historians is that pride and honor increased. So it was only a matter of wealth, but pride, honor, what we would call today bragging rights, increased with men's unfettered access to enslaved women's past, present, and future. It is for this reason that the conquests are so well documented 
commented without fear or shame. And what I'm commenting on here is the contrast with the abuse that was meted out, the, the sexual abuse that was meted out to men. And we don't have as many sources and opportunities for a peek into that history. But the abuse that was meted out to women by enslavers really added to the pride and honor accorded to these men. And as a result, they documented them quite well. Now, intimate relations between planters and enslaved women, we also have to remember, were nuanced by concubinage. And so it's not every instance of sexual access that was um, forced or um, what we would consider in our modern parlance, rape. So for some enslaved women, they benefited from wifely statuses with white men, and historians have focused on this quite a bit. But what I am contending as well is that less attention has been paid to these acts as a form of partner violence against white wives, who, according to Marilyn James in his book, The uh, Book of Night Woman, these women could only turn their eyes and sip their tea as their husbands ran amok on Black women's bodies. However, other historians um, and some of the research that I'm doing also notes that this normalized behavior, meaning the sexual access that white enslavers had to their um, black um, and enslaved women, was not always ignored by white women, as many exacted great cruelty to black and mulatto women, consisting yet another branch of gender-based violence that is not often studied, the female on female violence. These were rooted in jealousy and powerlessness to confront their own husbands. And so what do we have emerging? We have emerging this concept of quality women, which we actually see in our contemporary situations as well. So while some white women exacted revenge um, to intimate partner violence and infidelity through their own extramarital affairs with black men, or as I said before, in the cruel treatment of black women, quality women, and in this case, quality white women, lived um, a life enthralled to her husband. She would add sweetness and charm to public life, but was not to interfere or agitate against her, her partner. And in this context, we see that there is great um, uh, or quite um, prolific cases of intimate partner violence between white men and white women, which again is not as well focused on historically. So the quality woman's experience was one of intimate partner violence. Thistlewood, who I mentioned before, for instance, gives us a peek into a neighbor who he considered depraved. And if you know anything about Thistlewood, you, know, you would know that he was quite depraved. And so if he thought that someone was worse than him, it was really bad. So for instance, he told the story of one Mr. Cole who abused his wife financially, physically, emotionally, and he often kicked her out of her own bed to take enslaved girls of eight or nine years old and ravage them um, repeatedly. And this, of course, led to great unhappiness to his wife, but she could do nothing about this. And it was considered a private matter between husband and wife. As we move forward to the 20th century, Respectability and public secrets are how I am considering the instances of gender-based violence and intimate partner violence that we see um, as, as reported by the media of the time. Um, so these cases were shrouded in clouds of respectability and I will give you an example of this um, in a while. Violence against women, women, though common, was not publicly discussed by leaders. And this I find to be very interesting, with a few notable exceptions, such as Robert Love, who advocated against sexual exploitation of young girls as domestic workers in his newspaper, The Jamaica Advocate. However, what I find interesting is that there was relative silence from the Black middle-class feminists at the time such as Amy Bailey, Una Marson, and others, who we often celebrate, of course, for their um, amazing work with um, women at the time. But they were convinced that uplifting working class women required broadening of their economic opportunities, improvement in wages, working conditions, and education, which is something we replicate in our GBV and IPV discourses today. So these were seen as public issues to be dealt with by the colonial government 
as opposed to private matters between partners. So they didn't really touch these private matters between partners. What I meant before when I was speaking about respectability is, for instance, the headlines that you would see for uh, sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, rape, gender-based violence that you'll see in our historic uh, newspaper newspapers. So what I find interesting is that even more than today's society, domestic violence and IPV and rape featured prominently in the island's newspapers. You would often find in the Gleaner um, you know, days and days and weeks and weeks of trial reports that were printed verbatim about these cases where women's respectability was often put on trial. Um, but what you would notice, in fact, even looking at this headline is that you will never see rape in the title, you won't see certain words. For instance, you'll see Dr. E.H. Evans is being sued by mother who alleges attacking of a daughter. If you can read further, you will see things like the incidents and so on. And so there is a shroud of respectability that is to be maintained, but it was quite prominently featured in the newspapers at the time. Similarly to wife beating was, um, or intimate partner violence as we are considering it in our contemporary understanding, was quite prominent and prevalent in Jamaica. Uh, between say 1930 to the 1950s, you would see daily court cases of men and or women who were bringing spouses to the courts um, for issues of IPV. Interestingly, a lot of these were grounded and rooted in jealousy. And so there's not much time to go through all these articles, but all of these that I have given you which span from the 1930s to 1950s show that jealousy, um, infidelity, adultery usually was the reason or the justification given for beating a wife. Um, and these were treated pretty seriously by the court at that time. Um, finally, I just wanted to give an excerpt from H.G. Delissa, who was the Gleaner editor for much of the 20th century. This excerpt, Good News for Husbands, which at first reading, actually when I read it some 15 years ago when I was doing my PhD, I actually thought he was um, supporting the idea of beating of wives, but he was making a very sarcastic and a satirical sort of comment that was rooted in saying that women would have to be in the legislature and have to have certain rights and responsibilities in order to change these laws. And I'll quickly give you an excerpt where he said, I have just read that the English legal code enacts that a man may beat his wife with any weapon not thicker than his thumb, which is where we get rule of thumb from. I do not think this is generally known, so I hasten to give the fact the widest possible publicity. Many men have not waited for this knowledge before proceeding to action. They have frequently beaten their female connections and with weapons considerably thicker than their thumbs. I now implore them to ab abide by the letter of the law. After all, many men possess thumbs of a considerable thickness. And in the excerpt, he goes on to say that it is women who will have to get into the legislature to make the changes necessary for women at the time. And so what are the takeaways to reset it and to give context to what will be said by the other panelists? Historiography of slavery, including some forms of violence against men, need to be framed through the lenses and analysis of gender-based violence and intimate partner violence. GBV and IPV are deeply rooted in the history of the region's plantation economy and labor systems. IPV and GBV have intersected with race, ethnicity, and deeply held cultural norms to produce normalized and acceptable forms of violence, particularly against women. Importantly, as far as I'm concerned, quality women, which we want to um, sort of replicate today, were expected to not agitate against powerful men slash husbands. Jealousy and infidelity have historically justified the use of intimate partner violence. And finally, that leaders, even women, and even those with power, either political power or the power of the pen in the 20th century, have traditionally viewed IPV and GBV as private matters. And this is where I think we are left today 
with this thought that it is a private rather than public matter. And so I'm so happy to be part of the ongoing conversations which are publicly and important um, uh, contextualizing this as a public discourse rather than private matters. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Delia. It's so important, as you say, looking back to look forward, the importance of looking back to be able to look forward. And I took away from your presentation the point of how deeply rooted in the plantation economy and labor systems, IPV and domestic violence uh, are. Thank you very much, Delia. Before I go on, colleagues, um, you will um, permit me, please, to just acknowledge Professor Elsie El LeFranc, uh, Carol Watson Williams, Dr. Sharon Priestley, whose work I quoted from in my introductory remarks. And I want to acknowledge as well um, the Honorable Ambassador June Sumer. I was not sure, Dr. June Sumer, whether uh, you were on when we began. So special uh, welcome. Also special welcome, I see Professor Hamid Ghani from Salisa St. Augustine. I see Easton Williams from the Planning Institute of Jamaica and Taitu Heron, just acknowledging you. Uh, before we go on, before I move on to Dr. Corin Bailey, let me say that um, we are asking you to place your questions in the Q&A section here, not in the chat, but in the Q&A section. It's easier for us to manage that way. And you're free to move to pose your question, whether to a specific panelist or whether a general question open to all panelists. So colleagues, please remember in the Q&A to pose your question. Okay, so to explore now the contours of the problem of IPV and to locate it within an overall culture of violence in the Caribbean, where social relations are characterized by physical and psychological domination, I will invite Dr. Corin Bailey to speak. But before he speaks, let me just tell you a little bit of him. So Dr. Corin Bailey is a senior fellow at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies on the Cave Hill campus. He is a prolific researcher whose work is situated within the fields of sociology and social policy, but he has a very special focus on youth and crime and on poverty. His latest co-authored book publications are Caribbean Crime and Criminal, Criminal Justice, Impacts of Post-Colonialism and Gender, which he published in 2018. And the other book, Rethinking Poverty, Assets, Social Exclusion, Resilience, and Human Rights in Barbados, published in 2019. Thank you. So I introduce now Dr. Bailey. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ricketts. Um, and thanks, um, Dr. Bean, um, both for your um, your background and for um, making my slides look um, hungry. But so you go. All right. Um, all right. Patriarchy has emerged as a. Oh boy. All right. Forgive, <laughs> forgive the dogs. Um, patriarchy has emerged as a kind of uh, um, theoretical axiom as it relates to intimate partner violence. Um, and obviously, uh, while no analysis can um, take place absent of it, um, it's important to ask ourselves whether or not this provides an ad adequate background on its own um, against which violence against women can be discussed. We of course can, can acknowledge that um, gender violence takes place in a variety of different forms, um, has a range of, of, of victims. I think it's important to recognize that and to um, make the point that the focus on male to female violence, um, whether, whether intimate partner violence or otherwise, is not to suggest that other forms do not exist or are, are unimportant. Um, it's privileging is, is due to the urgency, the historical urgency really, um, and the severity of the issue. Uh, while both uh, men and women in the Caribbean have shown themselves to be violent, um, battering is a male to female problem. And the vast majority worldwide of those um, needing medical attention as a result of it um, are women. Um, 
at the same time, one can't totally isolate this from um, others since um, violence leads to violence and um, gender violence in one form can and, and does lead to its occurrence in, in others. But um, more on that uh, in a bit. Um, we heard some statistics uh, um, for Jamaica um, from Dr. Ricketts. Um, at least one in three women globally has been physically or sexually abused at some point in, in her life. Um, that's, that's, that's remarkable, obviously. Um, it's remarkable also that that, that statistic has basically remained unchanged um, over the last decade. Um, so violence um, against women in the Caribbean is no different. It represents a serious problem here. Um, with large numbers of, of women's and girl, women and girls affected annually. So what's this background um, that I speak of, um, you may ask? Um, the Caribbean societies are very, very violent spaces. Official statistics locate the Caribbean as a region, as one of the most violent regions in the world. And when you add Latin America um, to it, it is, um, um, by many estimations, the most violent region of the world. So we are uniquely violent. Um, and this expresses itself um, in many ways, it expresses itself in the form of homicide rates that continue to increase steadily and are, are accompanied by other forms of, of violent expression. Um, one study found levels of assault generally um, within the Caribbean region to have exceeded all other regions um, globally. Um, so again, as I say, we are, we are uniquely violent. It's, it's important to, to recognize that. I've often argued that, that one of the most damaging aspects of the, the legacy of slavery is the manner in which the, the strong dominate those in a position of weakness through force. That we've been taught to dominate those deemed to be weaker than us. Um, it, it, it can be argued that all social relationships are governed by power um, and that the threat of the use of, of that power in some form is, is, is part of that. It doesn't have to be violent. When the Caribbean, that power is generally expressed through violence. So if I challenged you to think of a social relationship in the region um, in which there is a power differential that is not characterized by violence, do you think you could? Parent-child, perhaps? Teacher-student? State-citizen? Heterosexual, homosexual? Man-woman? All of these relationships are characterized by those in a position of strength performing this strength through violence. We express our perceived deficits in power through violence. Most importantly, we are socialized in a manner that tells us that this is acceptable behavior. Um, what I'm going to do as I, as I go on is um, intersperse, kind of um, um, take you through my thought process and, and um, intersperse it with, um, with text um, and data from, from some studies that I've done. Um, the main, main one was a four island study um, across the region. Um, before I go on to discussing men and women, I just want to illustrate my point by way of expanding a bit on two other examples that, 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 that I highlighted. I want to show you, um, I want to use these examples to demonstrate how we are cu culturally trained to see violence, um, to, to use violence to dominate. So let's take teacher and student. Um, one of the more troubling and dangerous manifestations of this violent culture is a continued use of corporal punishment as a means of discipline by those charged with the responsibility of caring for them. So those who are supposed to care and love for them most. Um, the negative effects of, of corporal punishment um, include a range of, of psychological issues, but critical here is the fact that it's closely linked um, to violence and aggression into adulthood. Um, yet despite this, it continues to be used as a means of discipline across the region to various degrees. I'm going to focus on, on its use um, in schools. These quotes are, are from um, teachers and principals in school, from schools across the region. In that Four Island study I was discussing, I found that as many as 82% of teachers interviewed said that they used it, and 87% of children reported that it had been used on them. Children take their cues from the home and the school. Again, in addition to the psychological effects of corporal punishment that are, are commonly highlighted, one of the more damaging effects is the continuation of this legacy of violence as, as children grow to believe that this is an acceptable means of discipline as well as an acceptable means of solving disputes. Now, I mentioned earlier that some forms of gender violence lead to gender violence in other forms. I need to make a point here that boys are typically subject to these harmful practices to a greater degree. Um, an interesting um, finding from this study was a way in which many of the boys started to believe that 
um, they had internalized the, the the belief that they deserve to be beaten, and that it, and, and that this was a practice that worked because that's how you um, handle um, discipline. All right, let's pull out state and citizen. Um, the relationship between state and citizen, primarily um, via regional police forces, has long been a strained one, and it's one characterized by an institutional style of of policing that's designed to violently subdue. So I'm going to use the example of Jamaica here, um, where faced, of course, with chronic violence in um, typical of many low-income com um, urban communities, this style has historically taken the form of, of special operations in which legal, um, under which legal instruments have been employed with the aim of overpowering. Um, so this has propelled the, the JCF to portray itself as a powerful force. And the names given to these operations suggest the brutality that often comes along with them, um, as well as the intention behind them. Um, Operation Quick Draw in 1967, for example, that was designed to subdue Western Kingston. Acid was another. Uh, many of these were deployed in the 1990s. Operation Ardent was a, a combined military strike um, force designed to deal with crime and violence. Glock was formed to neutralize gangs in the inner city. Crest was a buffer um, between um, warring factions in, in Western Kingston. And there have been many more. And the um, gendered nature of this violence, again, is important to note because it, 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 it's typically the young men in these communities that bear the brunt of this relationship between the police and its citizens. So we've accepted and we teach that violence is how those in a position of strength should interact with those in a position of weakness. And this plays out with great regularity among all social groups and interactions. How then can we not expect this to play out between men and women? All right, the inherent um, direction of power involved in many of these relationships is probably obvious to all of us, right? Um, instinctively, I think it would be easy for us to accept that adults are able to access more power than children, right? Um, same for state and citizens, it's fairly obvious. We all know that patriarchy places women in a position of weakness as compared to men, but it kind of seems nonsensical that it, it persists, doesn't it? it? It should, it does to me. Um, nevertheless, uh, um, alongside this culture of violence and domination of those perceived to be weaker is patriarchy, or more effectively stated, patriarchal relations, patriarchal um, attitudes. The link between the argument that I am making and patriarchal relations is that um, the most destructive characteristic of patriarchal relations, as I see it, is the fact that it teaches that women are less than. They, don't, they, they do not and should not occupy the same status. And so in keeping with, the, with all the other social relationships that I highlighted um, a while ago, um, in which one group is less than the other, they are dominated by force, either violent or, or, or otherwise. There, there, there are people here, of course, that are, are better equipped to give you a lecture on, on patriarchal relations, but I just want to say that these are social and cultural norms passed down from one generation to the next that position men as superior to women, that position men as owners of women. Um, these ideologies are cultivated within a family and they're, they're perpetrated by and legitimized by external institutions such as the school, media, and church. Much of, of, of this manifests um, in the roles ascribed to men and women. We all know it well. Um, patriarchy oversees the indoctrination of women into um, narrow confines, mother, daughter, wife. Um, women have, um, to a large extent, been characterized as a, a homogenous group, um, with social, political, and psychological qualities that are separate and distinct from men, and such render them um, more suitable to specific roles. And so boys are taught um, boys and young men are taught that one, women are different to men, and so they're inferior. And that to their own identity as men is determined by how they perform the roles expected of them. So therefore their manliness, their masculinity is determined by how it is that they perform these roles. Um, so according to um, high school age boys interviewed in the same um, Four Island study that I referenced earlier, um, men are to look the part, for example. they are to be heterosexual. They are to exert dominance over women sexually. As well as in the home.
what we end up with are sentiments among young um, Caribbean men that privilege the aggressive performance of their masculinity, their manliness, and and um, that suggests that violence against women is an acceptable is acceptable either generally or um, under specific circumstances that that kind of that threaten their status um, as men. So the, the 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 impact of patriarchy on on, on violence is is nothing new. Uh, what I want us to understand is how patriarchy is but one aspect of our broader problem. Living in patriarchal societies does not make the Caribbean unique. What it does, what, what does make us unique is, is, as far as intensity is concerned, is the level of violence. It is alongside that that patriarchy is its most dangerous. So in keeping with my apparent compulsion to number my talking points, what, what's being internalized is that one, violence is an acceptable means of, of solving disputes. Um, two, those deemed weaker are to be physically dominated and violence is the accepted means of doing so. Men are violent, women are violent, children are violent, the state is violent, et cetera, et cetera. No group has escaped. However, boys are more often than not exposed to these harmful messages to a greater degree, as well as being victims of overall violence to a greater degree. And as such, they are also the perpetrators to a greater degree. And then finally, that women are weaker or less than men. Once we teach boys that they are superior, it lays the groundwork for them to express this through balance as they get older. Let me offer this in a different way. Once patriarchy gets a hold of Caribbean boys, they are going to express it through violence. Not because patriarchy has to be expressed violently, but because we are violent. Unfortunately, that's what we do. That's what we've been taught and that's in turn what we teach. So as we think about this issue, I think it's worth exploring all the symmetries of power that are at play in these displays of violence, as well as how um, each of us may assist in perpetrating this, these harmful messages. Um, the reluctance to allow to outlaw the harmful practice of corporal punishment, for example, and the support it continues to um, enjoy from um, general society underscores a lack of appreciation for the manner in which violence helps to cultivate and maintain a culture of violence. Let's use research from um, Barbados just to illustrate the point from um, Marshall Harris. Um, there is evidence to suggest that Barbadian children um, that experience violence in the home are at considerable risk of future uh, violence and delinquency. Um, in analyzing uh, 274 case files of juveniles who had been brought before the, the juvenile court, this study found that 79 children that came before the juvenile court were documented to come from homes in which they experienced violence, either directly or violently. That's a lot. Of the 79 children, 19 were charged with violent crimes such as assault and wounding. The approach to ending violence against women has to be a multifaceted one, a truly multifaceted one. And it's one that involves the dismantling of patriarchy, but it also has to be one that acknowledges and addresses the fact that this is part of an overall violence problem that we have in the region. You cannot be, you, you cannot be pro violence in any form and have a reasonable expectation that you are not signaling that other forms of, of violence like gender violence are acceptable. The messaging, the socializing cues cannot and should not be that violence is acceptable only within the narrow confines of one of the social relationships that, that I mentioned earlier. The, if the aim is to um, eradicate violence against women, the message has to be that violence generally is wrong. And this means, means removing all societal indications that it is not. I want to end just by preempting a line of, of commentary that I know may arrive. There's a view out there that those of us that, that advocate for intimate partner violence to be seen within a con context of overall violence are framing it as just another form of violence. It's a view that, that effectively asks criminologists not to view what we see as a criminological problem in a criminological way. Um, and that, of course, includes us using feminist theorizings where necessary, as we do. So I owe it to you to be very clear. I do not think intimate partner violence is just another form of violence any more than I think that violence against children is just another form. It's an atrocity with very specific um, precipitants that all require unpacking. I'm arguing that along with the manner in which men view women, these patriarchal relations, that our violent culture is the background against which it has to be placed. And I'm arguing that not doing so is to the detriment of its eradication. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you very much, um, Corinne. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, the point of the Caribbean being uniquely violent, and I like how you ended that IPV is not just another form of violence. Um, it's very, very, a very important point. 
and you definitely went back to um, you know Dahlia's linking up uh, uh, with the period of enslavement and how much that legacy of slavery um, is to 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 be to be seen as providing I would say the seeds or the roots to this problem. Thank you again. So. Um, Colleagues, just remember that if you have any questions, please place them in the Q&A section. I see there are four questions already, and we will take questions at the end of, the, of all the presentations. So we're moving on. We've heard from Drs. Bean and um, Bailey, and now we'll hear from Mrs. Sharon Coburn Robinson. So she will provide us with the response of the Jamaican state um, and she'll share the policy and program interventions aimed at reducing IPV, eliminating IPV and domestic violence, um, but more broadly, the policies and programs aimed at achieving gender equality. Let me tell you a little of Dr. of, of um, Mrs. Coburn Robinson. So she is the principal director of the Bureau of Gender Affairs here in Jamaica in the Ministry of Culture gender, entertainment, and sport. She's integral to the implementation of the national policy for gender equality. And she is the focal point for the gender division. This means that she represents the ministry through nuanced participation in several fora to ensure the seamless integration of gender in national policies, plans, programs, and projects. And I'm sure, Sharon, you will pick up so beautifully from how Corinne ended by giving us a few um, suggestions for how we need to move forward. Yes? So thank you. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you, Dr. Ricketts. This is really shaping up to be an excellent forum. And I like the way we've started and how we're progressing very nicely. So my task is to, one, do a very quick overview on the national efforts, but I think I'm going to have a little bias in that because we are the national machinery. My focus will largely be the work that has been carried out through the national gender machinery, that's the Bureau of Gender Affairs, and we are strategically placed within the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport. When I get towards the end, I will share with you some amendments that were made to the Domestic Violence Act, which is the biggest legislation that addresses this vexed issue of in intimate partner violence, IPV. So a quick uh, overview on IPV to pick up from where the other panelists left off. Intimate partner violence is inflicted by a current or ex-husband or partner in common law or visiting. And this is the most common form of violence against women and women of all ages. There is no discrimination against, uh, there's no specific age group that experiences IPV. This cuts across socioeconomic backgrounds and educational levels. IPV exists along a continuum from a single episode of violence to ongoing battering, beating, abuse. IPV includes several types of behaviors, and I will just list three of them. One is physical abuse, and that happens when a person hurts or tries to hurt a partner by kicking, hitting, and so on. The second one is sexual abuse, which is forcing the partner to take part in the act when this partner has not given consent. Thirdly, verbal or emotional abuse, and that can take the form of threatening a partner about possessions or just abusing by emotion, uh, removing or withholding privileges, harming a person's self-worth and just letting the person think that something is wrong with him or her in terms of you know, the physical characteristics and so on. So this problem of intimate partner violence has been a long-standing issue for decades to the extent that it is a direct and it is the most pervasive violation of fundamental human rights and often results in serious injury or death. Despite the prevalence and impact of intimate partner violence, it is underreported due to a subculture that is often referred to as the conspiracy of silence. The Bureau of Gender Affairs 
as the hugest part of the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport is guided by the National Policy for Gender Equality and is mandated to carry out several actions which are aligned with several policy and legislative actions being undertaken at the national, regional, and the global arena. These include, but are not limited to the following. One, support a widespread understanding and adoption of gender mainstreaming as an effective tool and strategy. Two, work closely in partnership and collaboration with other ministries, departments and agencies and other key stakeholders to strengthen the normative, legal and regulatory frameworks. Three, elimination of gender-based violence, which IPV is a huge form. And this is in our mind, a prerequisite for achieving gender equality. Four, lobby vociferously for a phenomenal increase in high quality financing to support the nuanced participation of women. And this is in all areas, including politics and decision making. Strategic positioning and gender responsive leadership to promote voice and agency and to leave no one behind. So this policy I spoke about earlier is very important to us because it outlines the government of Jamaica's commitment to achieving gender equality through gender mainstreaming and is informed by the guiding principles of gender equality and social justice, political leadership and commitment, multi-sectoral approach and partnerships. And the fourth and final principle is a participatory approach. Our government has implemented several measures, as you are aware, to address intimate partner violence and other forms of gender-based violence through a particular coordinated plan, which we call the NSAP GBV for short. The full title is National Strategic Action Plan to Eliminate Gender-Based Violence in Jamaica. And this is a 10-year plan which was approved in 2017 and will continue to 2027. The, it has main areas that we look at in terms of addressing to make sure that the coordination is seamless and it is embracing all areas of life. So I'll just pick out three main things that this NSAP GBB is supposed to cover. One is to provide a comprehensive range of services, including psychosocial counseling and support to victims and survivors of gender-based violence. And in most cases, we have to extend that to the family members. Two, facilitate, uh, facilitate the requisite support to victims and witnesses of violence to provide recovery and rehabilitation. Three, to work closely with perpetrators to create opportunities for alternative resolution and rehabilitation, among other options. Now, this implementation plan has specific areas that we focus on. And these areas look on prevention, protection, investigation, prosecution and enforcement of court orders. How do people take out a protection order and whether or not the protection order is upheld? You might have heard um, yesterday on Nationwide, a person who was, who was speaking definitively about her experience with the protection order in that this partner who is now her ex-partner had been violating the protection orders. And so even though it meant that this person should not come within X um, kilometers of her, the person violated it and she had some issues with that. So there's the issue of the enforcement. How do we assist persons who have taken out a protection order to get the restraining order in place once more and to have that protection around them so that they don't feel violated and hopeless. Another key area in the implementation plan is reparation, redress, rehabilitation. There is the issue of coordination for data collection to make sure that there is a robust data collection um, and data management system. So those, as I outlined, are the five areas that we focus on under this coordinated plan that we have. We also look at review of legislation. And the reason for this is several. There are several reasons. One is to ensure that there are um, improved opportunities for effective legal protection. There, is harsher, there are harsher penalties for persons who are offenders and also larger or more opportunities for redress for persons who are victims. 
of gender-based violence as well as their family members. We also have support that we provide through a special initiative that we have designed and that's a COPE initiative. The acronym is really standing for Community Outreach through Partnership for Empowerment. And this is because the Bureau of Gender Affairs within the ministry is in one place in halfway tree, but we have a reach across the 14 parishes. And so in the community liaison unit, that allows us to go to different areas and do the work. Now with COVID-19, it's limited um, interaction in terms of face-to-face. -face. So we do lots of virtual work and interface with persons who need to be supported. So this COPE initiative allows us to have a wider reach because we have persons who are doing work around intimate partner violence, gender-based violence, advocacy, helping young boys who are in um, conflict, res uh, conflict issues, having conflict issues or issues with truancy at school and other family issues that we consider important to work with. At this point, we are supporting 13 groups. And through the support of these 13 groups, we are able to do considerable amount of work through the implementation of our NSAP GBB, which I mentioned earlier. We've also increased the support and the work around the Jamaica Constabulary Force, having a support and referral pathway that allows us to have a smoother and more seamless um, integration of work. There's also support that we've been giving to facilitate gender sensitivity training for police officers and frontline responders to effectively recognize and respond to victims and survivors of intimate partner violence. You must have heard that we have opened our first national shelter. And so there are times when we need the support of the police to assist us to move persons. And this is how it works through that referral pathway that we have, we call, we give the information and they do assist with patrolling. Um, if it is that somebody is not feeling safe, they help with movement and they provide any other support. If there's a dispute, they can come in and, and warn persons, or if it is that it is escalated and there is a need for them to do more drastic, um, to take more drastic measures, then the prosecution steps in, the investigation takes place and they will follow through and we work with them to make sure that it gets to the end. We also do other modules of uh, training with them in terms of sexual harassment, and we look at domestic violence broadly. Now we have a campaign, the No Excuse for Abuse campaign, and under that campaign, we're able to have increased support through social media, having those numbers that, that persons would need to call if it is they need to access the shelter or they need to lodge a report, or they need to just get some support around issues that are you know, affecting them, family issues. They need to have guidance on how to treat matters and so on. They want to lodge a complaint. And it could be that they're doing it on behalf of somebody as well. The amendment to the Domestic Violence Act, the last set of amendments, allow for somebody to make a complaint and to lobby for another person who is not able to do it at that point. We also continue to dialogue with other ministries, departments, and agencies for strategies that are doable, practical, and cross-cutting. And we also join the call for island-wide partnership to support the continued implementation of the NSAP to address intimate partner violence, other forms of violence, sexual exploitation, and abuse. We also tackle the, this vexed issue of toxic masculinity, which we believe contributes in leaps and bounds to intimate partner violence. And this we do to ensure that there is harmony and peace in our society based on respect for life, and the whole idea of having freedom. So I want to just share with you a few of the amendments that we had under the Domestic Violence Act. I'll share that with you for you to see. So in terms of how it is that um, the, so on 26 April, 2021, cabinet approved the following amendments to the Domestic Violence Act. The first one is the definition. Now prior to now, the definition as you know, I think most persons would know because there were some very much gripes about the fact that this definition was not comprehensive, it wasn't inclusive, and so there were several gaps. So this definition is now inclusive of domestic violence as a larger framework. It includes new areas such as physical and sexual aspects of domestic violence. It also includes financial, emotional, and psychological aspects as well as exposing intimate partners 
through photographs as well as if you were in a relationship and it has broken up former partners sometimes use that on social media to intimidate and embarrass persons inflicting uh, reputational harm to victims and using third parties to harass victims that's the first one that has been accepted and that's a definition another one is a power of the court to grant protection orders or occupation order now i mentioned earlier about the protection order and the problem that sometimes happen with persons who take that protection order and the violation of it now the expansion is to allow for more persons to apply for protection orders and to have larger support so more persons to assist and this is that other persons can assist to take out protection orders on behalf of an abused person under this act. It was recommended that the Office of the Children's Advocate, household members, and the Minister with Responsibility for Gender Affairs, I think you know that is the Minister Olivia Grange, that she be given residual powers to also include entities such as the Bureau of Gender Affairs, and the Women's Resource and Outreach Center. So we can assist persons who need to take out a protection order or an occupation order and is unable to do so because of work or re-victimization, be traumatized or whatever it is. Another recommendation that was accepted is the application for protection order. The expansion of the conduct or behaviors that the court may prohibit, the, the, the court may prohibit the respondent from engaging in and is agreed that the existing conduct or behaviors was insufficient and did not recognize that domestic violence could occur in instances where the property which was taken belonging to the applicants and where third parties were used to harass applicants. So what it did is to broaden the category so that prior to now, it was not as broad, but now we have recognized that there are other issues that need to be dealt with, including other parties who are not necessarily intimate to the uh the relationship but they are third parties and they do have that ability to harass and intimidate persons another one is the application on the section four application for the protection order now this is to be widened to increase so that the threshold is widened to obtain protection orders now in this case the existing legislation allows for the hearing of an application for a protection order based on the listed behaviors. And this could grant anybody who is asking for it based on the fact that they have evidence to prove that it is required. So the committee agreed that the section was restricted and should be placed or replaced with the courts. On hearing an application, this should grant. So the courts, when you produce, this person who goes to make the claim, once they produce the evidence, the court should grant the protection order, especially if they are satisfied that the respondent had engaged in an act of domestic violence. Breach of a protection order. Now, prior to now, the breach was $10,000. And you might ask, what is $10,000? That's a long time ago. And we believe that that is very, very lame, like a slap on the wrist. And so the penalty was increased, the breach of that um, protection order. The fine was, was increased to 500,000. The conversation around it is that a million um, should be perhaps the, the, the going rate. But at this point, this is what we have, 500,000 or imprisonment for one year. And it was agreed that the previous fine did not serve as a adequate deterrent. So I think that's it for, um, I think that's it for, for that presentation, but I just wanted to end by saying we have very much understood and still do understand that gender-based violence based on all of the evidence that we have seen and all of the cases that we have seen, it's not anything that one person can tackle. And so we, we encourage persons to work cohesively under the coordinated strategic action plan that allows for those areas that I mentioned. It is subscribed the due diligence framework on the, it's and it's predicated on the fact that you must address all areas for you to have a very comprehensive reach and for you to have the impact that you desire. I have other information that I can share afterwards. And so I now yield to the other presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ricketts. 
Thank you very much, Sharon. It was important for you to have shared the amendments to the uh, Domestic Violence Act. So I thank you for that. The broadening of the definition of domestic violence, the broadening of the power of the court to grant um, protection orders or occupational orders, the broadening of the application for the protection order, the increase in the fine, all very important. Um, and as you spoke about the National Strategic Plan, uh, Action Plan for gender-based violence, um, I was heartened to hear of the work with the perpetrators. I suppose you will talk a little bit about that after um, in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Sharon. So colleagues, we are coming now to the last presenter. Last, but by no means least. In fact, very critical to this discussion because he'll be sharing experiences informed by his own work in public health promotion and as a psychotherapist in the Caribbean. And I'm speaking about no other person than Dr. Peter Weller. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Weller. Uh, Dr. Peter Weller is the founding chairman of the Caribbean Male Action Network, CARIMAN. And he's been a, an advisor to the gender specialist at CARICOM. He's a member and past president of the Jamaica Psychological Society and a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Psychologists. He sits on the Council of Presidents and Elders of the Caribbean Alliance of National Psychological Associations, CANPA, and he co-chairs CANPA's Committee on Disaster Mental Health and Psychosocial Support and they are currently focused on the response to COVID-19, the recent volcanic activity in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and on the upcoming hurricane season. And then I must tell you lastly that he sits on the board of the Coalition Against Domestic Violence in Trinidad and Tobago. So his current focus is on behavior change intervention, adult psychotherapy, group psychoeducation, and public health community interventions for social change. Let's welcome Dr. Peter Weller. Peter, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ricketts, and greetings to all who are participating today. It's a pleasure to join you in this discussion. It's also been very informative and enjoyable to hear the previous presenters. Um, when Dr. Bean gave the historical context, I couldn't help but think about some of the epigenetic potentially definitely transgenerational dynamics that that emanate from these experiences that our people have had over the years um, that still influence us today and as Corin Bailey highlighted it has created a very violent society that is a, 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 a comprehensively violent it's not unique to any one particular area and therefore if we're going to talk about change we're really going to have to understand that the mindsets that that are so automatic as to engage in violent behavior as, as, a, as a coping response, as a strategy, are deeply embedded. Um, you know, the, the transgenerational effect, but also in terms of the extent to which they are normative now and seen as acceptable. And therefore, um, as we heard from Sharon Coburn Robinson, the programs that the, that the Bureau of Gender Affairs um, has been initiating and, and maintaining, you know, she used all the words that I think are so critical, coordinated, collaborative, strategic. The fact that, that given the depth of the belief systems that support violent behavior, interventions are going to have to be comprehensive. They're gonna to have to be collaborative. And I'm gonna speak a little about that, perhaps to take the conversation a little further because we are talking here about behavioral change, behavior intervention. Um, I think it's critical to, to I'm, I'm titling the presentation, and so what? Because I use the word and a lot nowadays because everything is intersectional. There's so many factors influencing everything that is going on that when we get to narrowing our fo focus, we, we not only lose the big picture, we don't integrate the outliers, but we also therefore don't, I think, have an effective um, change process. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about behavior change and change processes as we, as we proceed. The violence that we're experiencing, unfortunately, is likely to increase. As we continue through this pandemic, 
as our uh, economies suffer, as our people get more stressed with the lockdown and the fatigue, as unhealthy coping increases, and as opportunities for healthy coping decrease, unfortunately, we can expect that we are going to have more aggression, more violence, and certainly more violence between intimate partners and in the domestic space. This is one of the sad truths of the context in which we live. And you know, we're seeing evidence of it, um, increased reports of domestic violence, increased calls to hotlines, and this is happening across the region, more in some places than others. Um, as Corinne Bailey said, of course, violence is meted out by individuals to individuals, but certainly the far majority of the violence that we know about and that is reported is meted out by men to women. Again, as Corin says, though, we have to understand violence as a, as a, as a social, cultural um, dynamic uh, that positions along with patriarchy, the, the kinds of behaviors that we observe when we talk about gender-based violence and intimate partner violence. So this is a complex thing. The history is complex. The diversity of, of, of players is complex in terms of the diversity of perpetrators, of victims, the diversity of programs, the diversity of belief systems that exist. And I'm speaking across the region because being based in Trinidad, I've certainly learned to appreciate diversity as it is experienced here as compared to the kinds of diversity we have in Jamaica, all of which influence the mindsets and the belief systems that themselves influence the behaviors that we're trying to change. We have to keep in mind also, and I'm going to get back to this, and when we talk about behavior change, we're not only talking about changing the behavior of perpetrators of violence, but we have to change the behavior of all society and it requires a whole society response. So I'm gonna speak a little bit now about the, the context of the idea of behavior. You know, so often we talk about changing behavior and we think about um, putting on a condom or wearing a mask or not hitting somebody. And yet behavior is far more complex than that, as we all know. Uh, the image that I usually use in terms of track, well, the concept that, I, that guides me is to understand that behavior is a product of what the mind has processed. And the mind processes the information in very specific ways based on the individual. However, there are commonalities because of socialization and because of how the brain is structured. What is definite is that the brain is pretty much programmed to avoid pain, to seek pleasure, to approach what is good and avoid anything that's negative, all in the interest of survival. Now, if we start looking at behavior as, as simply an approach and avoidance uh, dynamic, it gives one lens to understand how we need to intervene, but it certainly is not enough to define the complexity of human behavior. Um, what I want to begin by saying is that if we think of, of behavior, therefore, as um, using the image of an iceberg, um, with the tip of the iceberg above the water being the behaviors that we observe, because by definition, behaviors are observable responses to either external or internal stimuli and triggers. But that is not enough because if we're gonna understand behavior and try to change it, we need to understand what's under the surface. And I think this is what the previous presenters were talking about. The, the dynamics of the history, the complexity of the thoughts and the feelings, the attitudes and the be beliefs, many of which are not immediately visible, but are there as the basis and the foundation for the behaviors that we observe. Thus, any behavior change intervention must appreciate and um, attempt to address the complexity and the depth of this behavior. Now, to do that, we have to go beyond the awareness raising and the skills building. We have to try to address the attitudes and beliefs. The challenge we face, and Corinne highlighted it, uh, well, all the presenters highlighted it, is how deeply embedded these attitudes and beliefs are. Because they're so deeply embedded, they actually play roles far beyond the, dis the decisions we make about whether to be violent or not. They become part of our identity. 
And this makes interventions that intend to change behaviors even more complex because if the behaviors are not simply actions we do in response to a stimulus, but something we see that is based on attitudes and beliefs that are at our core, that are part of our identity, then they are not going to be easy to change. In fact, those core beliefs and, and, and attitudes are what stabilize us. You know, recent research, um, Kahneman, um, who won a Nobel Prize in 2011, I think, for behavioral economics, some of you will be familiar with this, you know, think slow, think fast, um, conceptualization, talks about the fact that, well, among many other things, he talks about the fact that we often think that if we can change behavior, we will change people's attitudes. But what he hypothesized is that what happens is that our thoughts and beliefs are in this, our thoughts and um, feelings are in the service of our attitudes and behaviors. So we are more likely to have an attitude or a certain um, belief and then organize our thoughts and feelings to support it. And unfortunately, those core beliefs and attitudes are very often intractable. And this is why you'll see, for example, um, what seemed, and I'll use this as a, as a potential example, what seemed like dramatic changes in terms of um, race relations or significant changes in terms of race relations in, in the USA over the last two or three decades um, were easily reverted under the past administration with the messaging about um, the othering of people who are different. And then you began to see people justifying behaviors that if you had spoken to them two years ago or three years ago, they would have probably given me a different argument. Core beliefs and attitudes were always present. Changing what you see on the surface is a step in the right direction, but requires support and change at a much deeper level. And this is why it is so critical, as, as, as Mrs. Coburn Robinson said, that we have a coordinated and comprehensive intervention strategy, because those interventions are the ones that are going to be part of a whole society, re-socialization that is going to take a long time, unfortunately. It does not mean that we do not do the immediate and short-term interventions, but we have to have this coordinated and collaborative and strategic approach that is going to change the institutions, change legislation, change the thing, the norms, et cetera, at least on the surface that begin to then bring up a new generation who are exposed to a different set of uh, experiences and therefore internalize a different set of beliefs and develop a different set of attitudes. But this is going to take a while and it has to be a developmental process. So I'll get back to that issue um, um, a little later. So as we talk about these behavioral interventions, whose behavior are we trying to change? And I realize it's a short time, so I'm gonna to have to compress what I think is a, is a far longer presentation with more details. But every time we talk about behavioral interventions, we, I find that people think, think about other people. They think about the community. They think about the target group, the women, the men, the perpetrators, whoever it is that is very often being disenfranchised or harmed. But really the change has to begin at the head of the stream. The change has got to begin with those who are in positions of power, of control, who are policymakers. This is a challenge, of course, because when it comes to gender and gender-based violence, very often those individuals are men. And therefore you're asking them to change their behavior, um, which, you know, whether we like it or not, it's for many men perceived as a demotion to equality. So there again, we have to understand the dynamics of that particular target group who are influential and who we do want to engage with wherever possible because of the influence and impact they have. This is not further um, you know, privileging men. This is practical. This is prioritizing a target group who has influence and needs to be part of a process not everybody in the group will be, but again, this gets back now to the targeting and the selection of individuals. So at the head of the stream, whether they're men or women, those who are in influence have got to buy into this process, which means that we have to try to influence them in the same way that we might try to influence somebody at the community level. These people are still part of society. They have the belief systems about gender, about patriarchy. 
They have religious beliefs that ground them and that um, guide their thoughts and feelings and therefore their choices. We have to target from the head of the stream. And the head of the stream, whether it is a state, whether it is academic institutions, NGOs or CBOs, we cannot assume that the folks who are going to allocate the funding, who are going to set, select the policy, have done the personal work that is required for them to appreciate the dynamics of something like gender, or it might be sexuality, whatever it is, we need to engage with them moving forward. And I would just right here say that all of this work, as has been mentioned by the previous presenters, requires the data. And this is why the academy is so important. This is why a forum like this is so important. However, change at the head of the stream also must require that the research that is done is not only um, robust and conceptually sound and so on, but provides utility. We have to make some changes about the excellent research that is done that gets kept in folders and files and dockets until it is published because you have to publish or perish. And in the meantime, her findings, which could have influenced the program that is being funded right now, are not made available. And unfortunately, as a result, the funders support an intervention that is not as effective as it could have been. And by the time your publication comes out with the data and the excellent insights, the program has already been done, the funding has been spent, the impact has not been happened, has not occurred. People are frustrated and, and, and depressed. Lives may have been lost. I'm not trying to make too big a case of this, but the reality is that we have got to promote more uh, a, a dynamic in which information and data is shared with the people who are actually doing the programs on the ground in a timely fashion and shared in a way that is accessible to them in the same way that the data that they're collecting in terms of their observations and their behavior change interventions is shared back into the acad academy for more um, deep, a deeper dive in terms of the research, et cetera. So the head of the stream requires behavior change. Behavior change means changing thoughts and feelings, yes, and, and overt behaviors, who you speak to, who you fund, et cetera. But it's also about addressing those deeper held attitudes and beliefs that are influencing the outcomes. Moving forward, of course, then the other issue that comes up, and again, the Bureau of Gender Affairs is, is trying to challenge this, this, this reality, how to facilitate a coordinated and collaborative approach. There is way too much territoriality. The territoriality splits the spaces and it not only means that there's not a, there's, there's a duplication of effort, but it means that the interventions that are targeting behavior, that are trying to send messages to individuals about how they should think and feel, um, are not coordinated or strategic. So, you know, you have one entity going into a community work with young people in the morning on Saturday, another organization going in at lunchtime and another organization going in in the evening. They have not synchronized their interventions. Their messages are not congruent. In fact, some of them are dissonant. And therefore the minds of the young people, for example, that we're trying to influence do not integrate because somebody has to help them integrate if it's novel information. They don't integrate it. So you know what happens after a while, they come for the food. They come for the lime. They're really not paying attention. And again, we have not had the behavior change impact beyond maybe some awareness raising. The case is being made here in support of what the Bureau of Gender Affairs is doing to not only collaborate and coordinate, but to be very clear what it is that you're trying to achieve. Are you, are you sharing knowledge? Are you raising awareness? Are you trying to develop personal insight? Are you building skills? Are you teaching a strategic way of approaching a certain problem? What is it that you're doing and what is it that you're building on? If we can move towards that kind of coordinated and integrated approach, I think that we will be far more successful in changing behavior. Of course, this all means that it has to start at the head of the stream. It has to inf in include all the influentials and it certainly needs to engage with all of us who are bystanders. And when I use the term bystanders, of course, we're talking about those who are observing whatever behavior it is we're trying to change. Very often we talk about bystanders in terms of gender-based violence and intimate partner violence. 
how do we engage them? How do we understand how history, that whole issue of, um, of public versus private issues of respectability, of not interfering in man and woman business, that violence is normal, et cetera. How do we challenge those beliefs? Well, we have to meet these folks where they are. We have to understand why people don't intervene and there will be different reasons and therefore our messaging has to address the different mindsets and perspectives that might prevent bystanders from getting involved. I use the term bystanders, not only, as I said, to speak to those who are observing a violent episode, but all of us are bystanders in the social dynamic in which we are involved. We are more engaged in some areas and less engaged in others. We have to move to a point and, and try to promote more engagement at air, in areas that are requiring change so that we can all be change agents. But then we have to understand behavior. We have to understand the dynamics of And I wanted to just mention here that <laughs> we all have internalized our own theories of behavior change. When Corin spoke about the use of violence and for example, parenting and corporal punishment, you know, corporal punishment is in part is, is a function of the, the frustration of the parent. But it's also because the parents and many of us have a belief that you punish and you reward the carrot and the stick. Licks and beatings, you will learn. If you don't hear, you will feel. Those are drummed into us, they are core beliefs. And unfortunately, there are some of us who operate at the policy and program level who, who no matter how much we learn about cognitive behavioral therapy and diffusion of innovation and stages of change. In the back of our minds, we just figure that if we can give them money, reward them, they will change. And if they don't, we'll beat them and they will change. So we have these internalized beliefs about behavior change and theories that are very informal, maybe not even articulated. Of course, you know, education and information will make you change. Well, knowledge alone doesn't change behavior as we know. And we know that we have therefore to go beyond that. But in the back of many of our minds, we figure if they don't hear us the first time, we'll say it again. If they don't hear us second time, we'll get somebody else to say it. They don't change the person and I will say it louder. No change in understanding of the dynamics of the behavior. No intervention that is coming from a different angle that appreciates the mindset of the individual. We just do what we're doing, but more. So we have got to change those mindsets at all levels of the socio-ecological level, whether it's at the individual, the family, the community, right up to the whole society. And if we can do that, if we can raise that kind of awareness to understand that behavior change is complex, it is not easy to, to, to find a magic bullet. One size doesn't fit all which means that we have to get the data, we have to do the research, then we all have to unpack it, look at it from all the different sides, like an elephant in the room, and then decide which role each of us as individuals or as organizations is going to take in order to successfully intervene. I wanted to share a couple other points I think that are important as we talk about behavior change. Um, one is the, you know, the lesson we've learned about communication for behavior change, the importance of doing the research to target the message. And I wanted to, to flag just the, the, the dynamic of targeted communication that has corollary messaging and collateral damage. I'm saying that because with all the best intentions and sometimes a very intuitive approach to what we needs to be done, we sometimes not only miss the boat, but we do harm or, or shoot ourselves in the foot because we don't really understand what is going on. The example that I can use most easily comes from, from when I was a psychologist with the, with the AIDS program in Jamaica. And a lot of work had been done um, to destigmatize HIV and living with HIV. And a lot of messaging went out around um, um, socializing with people who are living with HIV and AIDS, et cetera. The problem was that all the imagery that showed people living with HIV, having a normal and happy life, then began to counter the message that you shouldn't get HIV. 
and risk behavior began to increase and attitudes towards protection, et cetera, began to change among some populations because you have medication, there's no stigma. So it's no big deal. It's like herpes or the flu or whatever. That collateral damage can be dangerous because of course, if you're not protecting yourself, you can become infected, infect other people, et cetera. And that's direct relevance now to what we're trying to accomplish as we look at our response to the pandemic. It has relevance, of course, for gender and gender-based violence because we want to, for example, empower women, but we don't want to empower women to feel that they have to stay and fight it out with the man. So if we send a message that you are in charge of your life, you can take control, you can make your choices, we have to be very careful that a woman or anybody who is in a vulnerable situation does not feel that they have to stick it out because they should, they should make it work because they are empowered. It might seem like a bit of a sweat stretch, but I can speak to having heard that from women that I've worked with who have been in um, situations where they are conflicted between feeling like they should be able to manage and, and, and take charge and overcome and change the man um, while still realizing that they're at risk and, and, and in danger and need to make decisions. I'm simply using these as examples to say that we have to really do the work to understand the mindsets of the individuals we're trying to work with. We need to do that in ways that are collaborative. And one example of that was the, is the Partnership for Peace program that UN Women funded um, starting some uh, um, 15 more years ago, maybe, um, which is a psychoeducational program to try to change the behavior of men who have been perpetrators of domestic violence. Couple of points to make here. It was found to be a very effective program when it was evaluated. And one of the reasons it was so effective was that it was developed by a team of professionals from the Caribbean that included psychologists, counts, um, lawyers, gender advocates, uh, social workers, um, faith-based um, organization representatives, et cetera, who came together to create a module based on international research and standards, yes, but culturally appropriate. That program was found to be very effective in terms of preventing recidivism. Men did not come back in front of the court for, because they had been, they'd been taught, first of all, that they were of value and that they could be empathized with, but that they had to be accountable and they had to change their behavior because there were consequences for their behavior. But because the intervention was done in a group, they also had peer support and a sense of being part of a new and different norm um, with other men who could relate to what they were going through. We need to do more interventions like that because not only did that work with those men and, and has worked with men in the region, it's been done in a number of different countries, it also provided a lot of data and information about why the men thought and felt and behaved the way they did and how peer pressure, positive and negative, influenced them. And that in itself then informed other interventions that were based, that were targeting younger people at the level of prevention. So again, if we coordinate and collaborate, that is good. If we collect the data, that is good. And then if we integrate it into our programs so that they are more targeted, then they're likely to be more effective. The Partnership for Peace, however, has not um, evolved in the region. Why? Has not received the funding in many countries. Um, there has been, in some countries, some territoriality about ownership. And of course, a program like that requires fidelity to the structure. So if you don't have the resources, for example, for the male and female facilitator, for the space and time, or the referral of the number of men to maintain the group, then an intervention like that may not work. But of course, there's always men who need help to manage their violent behaviors. So it doesn't have to be court referred. And sometimes we have to think out of the box in order to collaborate and make the kinds of changes we wanted. So the partnership for peace was a very important one. The messaging therefore, again, um, in terms of coordination and collaboration, and I'm thinking right now about the current campaign in, in Trinidad and Eastern Caribbean. I don't know if it's, it's seen in, in, in Jamaica which is a stag bear advertisement that is talking about prevention of violence. There are 
there are mixed feelings about the imagery used, etc. But it is a far cry from earlier stag advertisements about it's a man's world. Um, you know, you wouldn't understand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's an attempt to move in a direction that we would want, where the messages are congruent with what we would hope would prevent intimate partner and gender-based violence. And again, it it is it is a result of collaboration between individuals. And I, I know Carriman um, contributed some of the some of the ideas that guided it, as well as others. If we work together, we can make a change. It's going to take a while to change the culture, but when we do a whole society behaviorally based intervention that understands the dynamics, I think it is more likely that we'll have the kind of impact we want. So I know I'm out of time and I just want to mention a couple of things that um, I would want to close with. The theme obviously is knowing where you're coming from, not only as a society, but as an individual. Where have you learned your core attitudes and beliefs? How are they influencing your thoughts and feelings? You might be able to make changes at the superficial level, but the deeper changes are going to require a far more coordinated and strategic response that is going to also have to factor in contemporary issues like pandemics, et cetera, that are going to cause stress and cause people to regress. But if you have a model, if you have a model to refer to, that shows you how people change over time. If you have a model that allows you to think developmentally and sequentially in the long term, then you can design interventions that say, parents need to do this with children at this age and at a different age. Children at this age need this kind of intervention. So the teachers and the coaches need to be sending these messages. Adolescents have these needs and concerns, and so they're going to need these kinds of interventions. And if you can create a model that guides all of the many stakeholders who are committed to making this whole society change, then we're likely to be able to have a more coordinated and collaborative and strategic um, process and possibly and hopefully more effective. The model I'm talking about is something that the Institute for Gender and Development, Carriman, and the Caribbean Alliance of National Psychological Associations is working with UNFPA to begin to explore and draft. And you'll be hearing more of that as we go forward. I know Kevin Liverpool is online from, is one of the participants from Caraman, he's the administrator of Caraman. Um, there's a lot of good work to be done, but I, I make the case that if you don't understand the science of behavior, psychology, and if you don't understand the dynamics of change processes, you run the risk of spending a lot of effort doing a lot of intuitive work that does not necessarily give you the impact you want. And it makes you feel tired and burnt out. So I look forward to more four like these. I'm grateful for having the opportunity to share and I'm sorry if I took a little too long, but back over to you, Dr. Ricketts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I think it was important, although you went over time, I think it was important for the sharing of those um, recommendations, the strategies. There was a lot to take away. And in the interest of time, you know, I will just intersperse them as we ask the questions. So thank you again, Peter. Uh, colleagues, we've had excellent presentations. I believe the four panelists out, out did themselves this, this, this evening, um, providing us with excellent, excellent presentations. So I have now the floor open for questions and the provision of answers. And so let me just turn to the Q&A and see what the questions are. So we have a question from Annie Paul, who is thanking you for your presentations. And she asked the question, how are we to understand anthropologist Herbert Gale's frequent assertions that numerically men are the real victims of gender-based violence and that women are responsible for much of the violence we experience? Anybody wants to take that? Corinne, Peter? I don't want to put you any of you on the spot, but just wondered, Corinne? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Um... He would explain. He would need to explain what he means by um, real victims. Um, men are victims of. We know that men are are victims of of violence. Um, 
to a, a greater extent than generally um, than than women are in the Caribbean, but they are the victims of of violence um, generally by their own hands. Um, they are the, they are the victims and the perpetrators um, of of violence to a greater degree um, by, by far um, than women. Um, so so my assumption is that he is um, he's trying to make the. I don't. I, I will stay far from. I don't know what he means by. Um, at the hands of women, but my, but my assumption is that he's trying to make the point that um, um, there there are um, the nature of violence um, that that men experience, boys and men experience is is very gendered as well, and that they are um, statistically um, victimized to a greater degree. As I said, it's important to recognize that they are are done so by their own hands. I don't think framing it um, as real versus unreal um, is particularly helpful. Um, but I think it's I think it's more important to um, unpack uh, what the different impacts are on men and women of um, of violence and indeed patriarchy, um, and try and bring about um, uh, a way to address it. Um, it's, it's not it's not really a competition between men and women. That, thanks, thanks, Karin. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if anybody else wanted to take that, so we can move on. Somebody's asking if you have any slides that could be shared. Will the slides be shared? I'm not sure. Um, I guess Salises could answer at some point. Another question, what is the current approach to work being done to reform offenders of IPV? I think it's perpetrators. Sharon and Peter, I guess this question would be more for you. What is the current approach to work being done to reform offenders? Uh, offenders of uh, of intimate partner violence. Sharon, Peter. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Ricketts. Well, I can't speak for all that is being done. What I can say is that um, as we talk about you know interventions targeting perpetrators, we need to understand that there there are different types of perpetrators. They all may have a overarching patriarchal mindset, but there is a difference between a perpetrator who has um, been violent once and a perpetrator who has been violent on a number of occasions over a period of time. There's a difference between a perpetrator who has a psych psychotic or um, personality disorder and whose thinking is not rational or reasonable. That's a different perpetrator from somebody else who um, doesn't have a mental illness and has a rationale for why they are engaging in the violent behavior. Um, an individual who thinks that to be aggressive towards a woman and controlling is part of, of, of God's plan and what the Bible or his religious um, beliefs have taught him um, has a different frame of reference to someone who um, just does, that when I shouldn't say just, but is violent when they are under the influence of substances. I think that therefore the point I'm making is that it's not a one size fits all. Um, the partnership for peace program, which I mentioned earlier, was a uh, 12 to 16 week psychoeducational program, kind of like group therapy, that was found to be very effective in changing the mindsets of these individuals by emphasizing the importance of their accountability, um, while still helping them to understand what had led them to, to believe that this was appropriate behavior. Those kinds of programs, unfortunately, are, are, are relatively difficult to run if they're going to follow the fidelity of the structure. One of the, the, the components of that program is that it is always facilitated by a man and a woman, a male and a female, um, to try to give a, a gender balance in the most simple way. Um, of course, individual intervention and counseling and psychotherapy are important. What is a little challenge is when attempts for mediation take place, because unfortunately, um, sometimes mediation that tries to engage the couple and, and get the man to change while staying in the relationship puts the woman or the victim at disadvantage um, because she cannot choose to leave. Um, she's being made to feel that she should stay and work it out while she's the one who is at risk. So there are a number of different interventions at the level of the, of the perpetrator. But I think the interventions that are also important are at the level of the peers, which is those interventions that are targeting the men who are friends of perpetrators, the men who are bystanders, 
who are being influenced to say something when they see something before it gets worse. And I think that we have to pick up on a number of these. I don't know if Mrs. Um, Coburn Robinson has, can, can share about some of the specific programs in Jamaica as well. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Peter Weller. So yes, I endorse everything that you've said. That's your special area. So normally, naturally, you can speak definitively to that. I also wanted to mention that you um, you spoke about the perpetrator as being someone who might not necessarily be male or might not necessarily be male because there are times when there are female perpetrators. So what we have done is to work with groups who are actually working with men, working with boys, in order to bring about behavior change and to see how we can unpack some of the issues, how it is that they can um, talk about why, the why of what they did and to work through strategies that will allow them to see the wrong of it and how it is that they can bring about reform. We have been having conversations, for example, with the Ministry of Justice to see how we can work through a refocus perpetrator program with the restorative justice arm of the ministry, as well as the Ministry of National Security looking at the correct, uh, correctional services and another special program that they have that would allow us to have some amount of alignment. We believe that the, it's important to have the resolution of whatever conflict it is and to have the rehabilitation and to have them speak definitively about the issues, just talking about it. What we find sometimes based on the conversations we've had and the groups that we have supported, some of the stories they give us is that they do not speak about the, the issues perpetrators sometimes have bottled up issues that come out at times and it comes out wrong. And in many cases it comes out violently. And so we believe it is very important to have them speak about the issue. So there is Mugabe, for example, that's Men of God Against Violence and Abuse that works with men and boys to have conversations and to do real time programs. Looking at, um, there's a program we did with, with the um, Jamaica College, for example, more than an athlete, not just a player. So we looked at boys and particularly young men and um, adolescents who were involved in sport and how sport was used as a channel to have that pent up frustration and some of those issues that they had that they were dealing with as um, you know adolescents and so on. Some of those issues with, with puberty, they were going through issues in terms of resolving conflicts and some were having frustration and not sure how to deal with it and so on, broken relationships and all of the nine yards. And what we found is that we brought mentors who had walked the walk. They had been perhaps athletes themselves as a young person at school. And now they are an adult and they were able to share with these young boys how it was that they were able to navigate those challenging times that they had and what sort of strategies they could use. Of course, the answers were not homogenous. And of course, it wasn't that they are expected to pattern these men but at least they were able to listen to testimonials of persons who had been through it and they could actually decide for themselves what part they wanted to take and how they were able to craft their strategies. There's the conversation that goes on with boys through Mogamba, talking about you know, how it is that boys are managed because what we recognize is if we want to change what is happening, we have to start earlier to make sure that we have this conversation with the boys and the young men so they don't become adults, some of the, the male types of behaviors that we're seeing with toxic masculinity and so on, we want to try to change it from early. And so, yes, we have been having interventions and we have lots more that we could do. We've had um, interventions, for example, Dr. Weller was a part of that intervention we had with the, from the, Guyan, the Guyanese um, group, we're doing something with men and masculinity, just unpacking the issues, having um, so Barbara Bailey was a part of that conversation as well. And we had so many ideas that were thrown up with persons just unfolding and self-disclosing. And what we found is just having them talk about the issues. Coming up with the strategies together made a whole world of difference. And so I will end here, but just to say that the cohesiveness really works. The, 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 the bonding together makes a difference. When person recognizes, I'm going through this by myself, but there are other persons who have gone through similar things and there are options out there and there are avenues and spaces that we can actually have to see. And finally, I want to say we have recognized the importance of talking through stuff. And so our male desk, which is now upgraded to a unit, allows for 
persons who need to speak about what is happening to call and we have a specific hotline it's really a helpline at this point until it becomes a helpline until it becomes a hotline rather and that particular number allows persons to call and speak with a male that's our male um, special desk person who will speak with them about what is happening and he might not be able to give them all the answers but we have a referral system that works because we are a part of a network of services and of course, it's, it might not be solved in one day or one episode, but the ongoing uh, you know, conversation and just linking persons with other groups and other persons who can actually help yourself being very, very um, knowledgeable in your area, haven't had a wealth of experience, would be able to assist in that area. So you did mention earlier about the networking. That's very important and working together, working collaboratively. So I'm thinking that if we do it together, it will make a world of difference. I think those are my thoughts on that question. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Are you hearing me? Yes? Yes. OK. So I want to um, I want to pose some of the questions which have already been answered. So there's a question by Leanne Leavers, and it's been answered by Dahlia. Uh, so Leanne asks, is it worth talking about the emasculation and dehumanization of male slaves and subsequent that has on the development of patriarchal values that normalize violence against women, particularly within black communities. And Dalia says, thanks, yes, it's important. This is certainly a straight line from state or public violence. There is a straight line, sorry, from state or public violence and that which is exacted in private spaces. But the larger point is that much of the violence of the plantation economy was gendered in nature and we have not always looked at it in that way. Another question which was asked um, by an anonymous person was, we currently have more women politicians in positions of power than ever before. Why is there still a limited shift in terms of legislation around women's rights? And Delia answers. Delia, you wanna just speak the answer? <laughs> So you can verbalize the answer. Thanks. Yes, um, that's a question that has been asked many times in many spaces. And we've actually had one of our own PhD candidates address this issue in a thesis, um, Jacqueline Core Hall. Um, but there are many, many facets and um, uh, ways in which it can be looked at. And what I was saying to the, to the person who asked, and thank you for that question, is that I think that we assume because uh, women are in seats of power that they will want to address these things that we consider to be women's rights issues. Um, and this, this is not always the case. There are other issues which politicians tend to see as broader macro economic and um, sustainable development and all of these kinds of issues which they tend to focus on and tend to see these issues as niche issues which uh, we we have been doing a lot of work in gender studies and in other spaces such as Salises um, to show that they are public issues which heavily um, are connected to these issues of sustainable development and macroeconomics and so on and so the reframing is necessary to um, show the ways in which these issues are not female specific only um, and so on. And there's also need for training. I do believe that there is need for training of politicians in general, regardless of their sex, um, as to the, the, the nature of these issues and why it's important to deal with these in this, the seats of power which they hold. And the other point I was making is that traditionally too, male allies in seats of power have done a lot. Um, and this is also part of what the history tells us that it has been, um, you know, male allies in, 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 in legislative seats that have pushed a lot of these agendas that are seen to be women's issues. So there are lots of things to think about, um, but I think one of the things, as I said at first, is that we can't assume that because one is a woman she will necessarily want to, to align herself to these issues as a niche or specific area. So that was what I was saying in a nutshell. Thanks, Delia. Delia, since you're on, um, I believe this question might be answered by yourself, Corinne, and Peter. So Easton Williams from PIOJ asks, how does patriarchy work to negate men in the Caribbean? 
Um, patriarchy, I'll, well, you, you did say that for three of us. Um, I'll just start off by saying that uh, traditionally patriarchy has affected all persons um, in many, many ways, some of which our panelists have been speaking about. And um, one of the things is that patriarchy is about hierarchies. And so even though we tend to focus on the hierarchy of gender, as in male over female, they, there are hierarchies within masculinity as well. And not all masculinities are ideal and not all masculinities are, um, some masculinities are subordinated. And so the way we treat with men who we think do not live up to certain ideals of hegemonic masculinity or the ideal male is definitely one of the ways in which patriarchy undermines uh, masculinity as well. So we see men acting in a certain way that we think is um, not masculine enough and we berate them as a result. Even going back to how we raise our children and raise our boys to say that you must be tough, you shouldn't cry, you shouldn't show emotions. All of these things are to steer men away from homosexual um, proclivities or behaviors. And this is one of the key ways in which patriarchy does um, men a great disservice. There are many other things, but I will um, leave some for the other panelists to address. Thanks, I think that was an excellent answer. Any, um, Corinne or Peter, do you want to add anything quickly or we could move on? You can oh, move on from add, my person. Okay, men. so Peter and Karen. <laughs> yes. It affects men's health because they have to be strong and therefore can't seek health. So the chronic um, non-communicable diseases are high. It affects men's mental health because they can't talk about their issues or concerns because it will show weakness and they may look like they're one or the others. It affects men in terms of their fathering because patriarchy has never promoted nurturing behavior among men which means that men's engagement is not simply a matter of choice that they don't want to, but they're not allowed to, they're not supposed to. And what is even worse, when they do try to, they do not necessarily have the competences and experiences to be successful, which also can lead to problems. So there are many ways in, men, in which men um, are harmed by patriarchy um, that we need to consider and we need to engage in conversations with men so they understand that this patriarchy thing is not about against men, it's about a process of socialization that we need to overturn. Thanks, Peter. Karin, did you want to add? Um, no, no, I'm okay. fine. I think they both um, yes, that, Yeah, I think they did. Okay, so I will ask Sharon. There's a question from D Chambers. How do we agitate for the legislation to be amended so that the rich or persons in the upper class can also face more stringent measures. And that was directed to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ricketts. So in terms of the legislation, the, that particular legislation would be the Domestic Violence Act, I think she's speaking to. The penalties that are leveled in terms of who is going to be paying the penalty, whether it's in most cases a perpetrator, it does not discriminate based on social class. I think the idea is to ensure that whatever the penalty is, that it matches the gravity of the offense and that it is the it goes as far as possible. So we have in Jamaica our drafters, and in most cases they will be guided by what pertains in the Jamaican legislation, the cases that we've had, the legislation that we've had, as well as the regional framework. So normally they would do the research. So we would work with the Ministry of Justice. The, the Ministry of Justice has a legal reform unit and there is the Chief Parliamentary Counties Office, there's Solicitor General's Office and all of those arms of the Ministry of Justice would provide support. And I speak of that because at this point we are still having discussions um, at the level of the, well, the joint select discussions on the sexual harassment are completed. And that bit of legislation, the Sexual Harassment Act is now being finalized. And we had some conversations about the penalties and how to have the fines being so uh, aligned with perhaps persons who can afford. There were persons who had the same kinds of arguments or you know, raised issues like, what about persons who can afford it? Should we make it as high as possible so that, you know, it's or make it high as, as high as possible so that they will not, they will think twice, for example. And uh, Again, we had to be guided by the what exists 
um, the, the, the level that is used, the higher limit, and the, you have a higher level and a lower level in terms of the fines. And again, that can be a policy decision because the committee for every bit of legislation has been debated, discussed. It's normally done through a joint select. And so the persons on that committee have that latitude and that leverage to be able to negotiate for the maximum, for example, and have it on a, on a continuum, for example, maximum of 3 million or 5 million, a minimum of 1 million. And then they, if it is that they're having a tribunal or whichever body is going to arbitrate on it, then that can be done in a very nuanced way. But there is no uh, discrimination, for example. So it's not as if the, it has been done to ensure that the rich pay more or that they, the, the poor cannot afford it. It has been done so that whatever the offense is, that it should match the gravity of the offense. And the perpetrator should understand that it is a, there's a zero tolerance approach to whatever is done and should face the force of the law. And the victim should certainly feel that justice is being served and that we are on his or her side. Okay, Sharon, you have the floor. There's a question of whether there is an aim to make our Sexual Offenses Act and the Domestic Violence Act gender neutral. Uh, so both of them, sorry. Yes. So both the Domestic Violence Act and the Sexual Offenses Act are in fact gender neutral. There were some conversations that we had at Joint Select Committee and at this point, Cabinet has given permission to reopen the discussion so that we can continue to have the discussions because there were some recommendations that were discussed but were not accepted for whatever reason. And so they, our minister, Minister Grange, took a, did a cabinet submission and which that was taken to cabinet and approval was granted, one, for the amendment to the Domestic Violence Act, which I shared earlier, to be accepted right now based on the gravity of the situation and the fact that we have had so many new cases of intimate partner violence and for the conversation to continue so that those other recommendations that were not fully agreed on or there were issues or gaps to have those treated with and to also reopen the discussion on the other pieces that were not completed. Speaking of the Offenses Against the Persons Act, the Sexual Offenses Act and the Child Care Protection Act. So there is scope for that to continue the discussion and perhaps during that discussion, it might be that those fines are raised and especially given our context realities, I believe that there's a window of opportunity for that when we have the continuation of the discussions. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. There is a question from Professor LeFranc. Prof, could you ask it? Is Richard, is Professor LeFranc able to ask the question? I will open our mic. Okay, okay. thank you. Prof LeFranc? Prof, the mic is open. You can unmute and ask a question if you want. No, let me, let me, I have to, I had written it down. I think the question I want you to ask is, why is it? Well, first of all, I noticed that there's still a tendency to talk about domestic violence only in terms of female battery, where there's no abundance of information to show that there's a lot of male battery as well. And sometimes the women are doing it even more than the men. But and some of the complexities of that that we need to understand. But a question, that, a superficial question really, that really passed through my mind. Why is it that men in the Caribbean never seem able to justify their dominance or their superiority or their control in anything else but in terms of physical attributes. Nothing else comes up. I mean, this is not the same in other societies. And what, what do the, when the women do it, what justification do they use? Certainly not physical attributes or the need to maintain their, their feminine um, physical superiority. That's the same question I was wondering about. Thank you, Prof. I believe Peter and Corinne might be uh, able to answer. Who will go first? Peter, uh, Corinne? Uh, okay, I can go. Okay. Right. Um, uh, two parts to that. Um, as it relates to the, um, the, the incidents and, and our propensity to um, focus on the, the, the male to female. I think um, that's the reason why I kind of started my um, presentation in, in, in the way that I did. I really do think it is um, important to acknowledge that um, th th there are so many different forms of, of, of gender violence um, and that 
um, both women and men are, are perpetrators um, of it. And that is um, 100% true. There are, there's, 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 there's something called um, gender symmetry, which I'm sure um, um, most of the people here have, have heard about, but there are a number of studies that um, have shown that the, the, the incidence of, um, of violence within intimate partner relationships, um, there isn't much difference in terms of the, um, you know, when you break down the, 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 the types of, of, of violence perpetrated, hitting, kicking, uh, spitting, et cetera, whatever. There isn't much difference between um, self-reported cases of, of male perpetrated um, as opposed to um, female. Um, and so an acknowledgement that it happens is, is important. However, I think it is, is I, I will remain um, steadfast in my belief that it is critical for us to um, um, justify our focus um, as a result of the fact that, as I said, the, the battering is a male to female problem. And the statistics are um, unrefutable um, that the majority of, of, of people that end up in hospital or dead as a result um, are women. Um, so the focus, I mean, I can't speak for anybody else, but certainly my own focus um, on the male to female is not as a result of um, a lack of acknowledgement that other types occur, but because of the um, severity of it. Um, I'll let um, Peter answer the second part of the question. Thanks, Corin. Peter? Yeah. Yeah, just briefly, I think that um, because of the, the pre-evidence of, of violence against women, by far um, greater than violence of, by women against men, there is a concern clearly articulated that if you shift the focus to look at violence by women against men, there is going to be something lost in terms of the awareness and need for support um, for women who are violated. And I'm, I can understand that because as we said, the powers that be are, are of a mindset that, that is part of that old socialization. So it's a valid concern, but it should not be a concern that shackles our investigation of the behavior and our understanding of the dynamics and our design of interventions. Unfortunately, it is not a comfortable conversation to have for many people. And so many people shy away from it. But I would hope that in the spaces in which we operate, we understand that humanity, psychology, anthropology, and sociology, et cetera, et cetera, biology are not themselves shackled by gender. They overlap with and intersect with and we have, to, we have to have those conversations, um, uh, especially as things are changing and the dynamics between men and women and all genders are changing. So I think that there is a pressure not to shift the focus because of the potential loss of, um, of attention to a very serious problem. But I think that the focus needs to be broadened. And those of us who understand that, I think, need to continue to have those conversations while still working to protect women who are the ones who are most violated and men who violate each other and are more abusive and physical with other men than with women. Thanks, Peter. There is a question or, or a challenge um, from Dr. Michelle Commission. Um, she's challenging the, the label of the Caribbean as being more, the most violent region and the people of the Caribbean being the most violent. She says, how could this possibly be when the people who have committed the most violent atrocities in the history of mankind are those of European descent? Moreover, almost on a daily basis, we witness mass shootings in the US and street stabbings on the streets of the UK. While it is true that violence does exist in the Caribbean, in my opinion, to label the region as the most violent in the world, is to fall into the trappings of the colonial mindset and stereotyping of the behaviors of people of color. Gender-based violence, male to female, is a chronic issue in many, many countries, USA, UK, India, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And wider societal violence is also a major issue in these countries. Anyone wishing to answer? Well, I think it was directed at me. Yes, well, it's, um, yes, yes Corinne. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually a question. Um, that's a heavy one, but I think it, it's it's based in a misunderstanding of really what I'm saying. I'm not offering an, a, really an opinion or a referendum of of of, of Caribbean people as opposed to um, other um, places in the world. Um, the, the, it's based on official police statistics, which are not going to to capture um, historical atrocities, nor is it going to capture war. So, um, based on official police data. Um, the, the the Caribbean um, and and Latin America um, is um, by many accounts um, um, one of um, which is which is um, irrefutable, but by some the most violent region in the world. Um, also, um, we have to remember. Um, yes, um, again, I'm not defending America. Never would. But um, we're talking about per capita rates as well. So. Um, these, these are these are based on um, official statistics. Um, if if uh, we trust the statistics, um, it's, it's 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 basically um, an analysis of those statistics and not an opinion on, um, on on Caribbean people nor Black people. So it's really nothing um, to get offended. Oh. Thank, thanks, Corinne. Here's a question from Professor Henry Lee. What does the data tell us about the impact of the pandemic on intimate partner violence? Peter, I believe you, you um, alluded um, to that. She's asking, are there any interventions with young men and women to educate them on IPV? Examples from Trinidad, Barbados, and Jamaica. Oh, so she's asking like two questions. First, what the data tell us about the impact of the pandemic on IPV? And then she's asking whether there are any interventions with young men and women to educate them on IPV with examples from TT, Barbados, Jamaica. Um, Peter, I think the question on the impact of the pandemic you could take. Um, yes, well, I'm not sure I can speak that to, to data. I can say that anecdotally, which is right. a form of data, there are increased reports of, of intimate partner and gender-based violence. What is confusing and clouding the situation is that there are more services and more promotion of the hotlines and police having um, yeah, you know, units that deal with, with domestic violence, et cetera. So there's a space to speak about it. So it's not clear whether the increased, re increased reporting is because there's somewhere to talk or it's actually happening more. But anecdotally, because of the lockdown, we have to remember that those who have been violated in the past are now more likely to, to be violated because the stress is increased, the opportunity to, to escape is limited. Um, so there's a move in the Eastern Caribbean to develop more hotlines to help support those who might be affected by gender-based violence. Um, certainly the Coalition Against Domestic Violence in Trinidad is doing work in terms of preparing for how the pandemic might increase the number of um, callers um, and users of the service. To speak to what is being done for young people about intimate partner violence, I would only just want to mention that when we did the Partnership for Peace program with men, and as I said, out of that came a lot of rich material that informed for example, the foundations program that the UN has, has, has developed, which is for prevention, and it, it is about working with young men and young women um, about gender, about relationships and intimate partner violence. What I think is a gap is that I am not aware of any particularly well-coordinated or documented intervention that facilitates conversations between young men and young women. And I think that is a significant gap in terms of um, behavior change because it is not providing a space that allows them to, in a safe, in a safe atmosphere, communicate, challenge each other, identify issues, and work towards resolutions. And I think that is an area that warrants not only research but uh, but the design of interventions. Over. Thanks, Peter. Corinne, I saw. Yeah, your hand is. You you wish to answer as well. Yeah, so so we do have some some data on it. The the I should say the, the data um, during the pandemic it's been hard to come back. As you, as you can imagine, um, the um, police forces are are stretched, um, and um, and so it's been it's been um, slow coming, and then we don't get um, complete data. But we're working on it. Um, but for, but we we have gotten for um, Trinidad, and it's and it's been a a puzzling um, reveal 
um, because there, there has been no, there actually has been no, there was no, I should say, um, pandemic effect um, between um, January um, 2019 and December 2019. Um, but there was a un unexplained um, a massive spike um, in like in the three months subsequent to um, December 2019, and we're talking about when there was no lockdown um, in um, in Trinidad, people were still moving around. Um, so we're unsure as to what that means. We'll do some some um, some theorizing and, and further analysis. But there was a there was a tripling, um, and um, I'd written down. Um, um, oh, right. Even more puzzling is that um, after the lockdown started, the current lockdown, um, cases have come down. So we're, we're, it's not really following um, the, the trend we would expect, um, but we'll see. Hopefully, um, as time passes, we'll be able to, to make some more sense of, of the data and also collect more from, from the other islands. Okay. Uh, uh, Sharon, anything from Jamaica? What have you noticed, your, the ministry, the gender, you know, the bureau? So in terms of the, the data, yes, we have, um, we've been advised that there has been an increase and we have, we have actually seen it because we've had cases where persons have indicated that violence has increased during COVID-19 um partners have turned against them we actually have persons in the shelter right now because of that that increase in violence where um persons have discussed that the the partners it it, it has become so toxic in the home that it is unsafe and they have had conflicts arguments and it has it has become heated in some in some cases until it becomes violent and they have to flee so we have had um, real cases that have been brought to our attention in terms of persons who have had that um, done to them and they have had to leave the relationship, leave the family with the children or to just leave by themselves and go somewhere else simply because of, of what is happening. So we have seen an increase. And we've also seen where the, when we speak with the police because we now have an increased relationship, improved relationship with the police in terms of just um, having that gender sensitivity discussion and sensitization around how to treat with issues. We have heard in many cases that some police officers have not been treating persons in a manner that is amicable and in some cases been very insensitive and you know just been a little rash or rude or sort of like not aware and telling them to go back home and work it out because it's a man and woman issue. And so persons have asked for this sensitivity to happen. The commissioner himself has indicated that he is making sure that the workers, frontline workers and persons who are first offenders are able to have this kind of sensitization done that will increase their sensitivity. So when persons complain about or come forward to report that they will listen and they will not um, judge, <clears throat> sorry, pass judgments or you know, come up with their own conclusion and tell them that they to go back home and work it out. So we've seen that this is allowing us to have a complaints and response protocol, which is something that we've always wanted to have. And that complaints and response protocol is something that came out of a strengthening state accountability project that was earlier that states that we're, we have to increase the relationship and broaden, for example, the areas that are, are available to women to report incidents of crime when it is that the female is aggrieved, we know that not only women experience violence, so if it is that it is a male who is violated, that male person should feel very free to report. We know that persons have complained in some instances that there is a stigma attached to male reporting violent episodes and violence done against them. And so the idea is to ensure that it's gender neutral in terms of who reports and the treatment should be no different, whether it is a male reporting or the female reporting an act of violence. So yes, we have seen that information coming out and we have had real cases reported to us that we've had to treat with. Okay, thank yeah. you. Well, we're wrapping up. I see it's 7.18 and I don't want us to go much longer. I think we need to end by late is 7.30. Um, Sharon, there is a question here from Dr. Gillian Mason. She says, when you spoke about the restorative justice, um, in light of the fact that this is not appropriate for all couples, 
thinking specifically about issues of power, do they have any current practice for identifying for which couples this might be an appropriate approach? And if you could explain the strategy, could you do that quickly? Sure. Yes. So the refocus, and thank you for that. So we do understand that not all couples are going to be able to have conflict resolution or mediation done because we have found in many cases that that can be harmful to the persons involved because in many cases there are unresolved issues and sometimes what presents as the issue are not what presents as the issues are not necessarily the issues sometimes there are hidden unresolved issues that are not coming to the fore so this perpetrator intervention that we are speaking about has to do with taking the perpetrator approach because the NSAP, which I spoke about earlier, which is a plan, under, underscores the importance of treating with the perpetrators in a separate space. So you have victims and survivors and you provide the services that they require, whether it's a shelter, psychosocial support, mediation, and so on, for the victims and survivors. You take the witnesses and you treat with them. And the third layer would be the perpetrators. So they would be done separately, not with the person who is the, the, um, the receiver of the, 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 um, the violence, not the victim. They will be done separately. And this is because we have had interface earlier. Dr. Peter Weller talked about the Batteries Intervention Program. That's something that we have actually experienced and worked through with. And the program, something for change, what was the name of it? That particular program he spoke about. We are aware of that as well. And so, based on the fact that we had that interface with uh, Dr. Beale, Hubert Beale, when he was doing that, and also with Dr. Peter Weller under the Batters intervention. We worked with FAM plan as well, because they also had that where persons would actually just sit and talk through what the issues were, whether it is that this mandatory counseling, because they were um, a part of the prison system being incarcerated or on parole, and they were asked to speak out and just to craft strategies that would allow them to actually find alternatives to why they did what they did and how they could look at it differently. So it is case management approach, a case management approach that is used. And it is not designed to try to bring uh, peace between couples because that sometimes does not work. So it's taking the perpetrator by himself with other groups of men who are, or women, because in some cases they are women. It is gender neutral because perpetrators, there's no sex discrimination. So if you're a male perpetrator or a female perpetrator, you can be included. And the conversations that we've been having with the ministries certainly indicate that we will be looking specifically at the issues that cause the person to become a perpetrator in the first place. And having discovered why they became a perpetrator, how can we look at current strategies, whether it is at the national level, the regional level, international best practices, and craft strategies that will help them. The idea is to have rehabilitation and reform for them to have alternatives to being violent. So we will not have this continuous violence and the, trying to reduce the number of cases that we have to provide them with a, a range of options so that they will not think it has to be violence if there's a conflict. And that's the only way to solve the issue. Thanks, thank Sharon. Uh, Althea McBean, is um, saying that she believes that violence meted out to boys in the home is largely ignored and needs to be addressed. I think Corinne and Peter Althea um, acknowledge this, um, but they can they can um, they can elaborate or you know they can give a comment. And there is an anonymous attendee. I'm just linking these two issues. Who says that males are not raised to express emotion? How does this emotional constipation affect the ability to process explosive anger? What the escalation methods would repair this? Peter and Corin, I believe this is more in your um, area. Any any responses? Um, well, the, well, the second question is definitely um, Peter. Peter. But, yes. But for the for the first, I mean, it's more of a comment, not a question. I, and I. Um, um, I mean, it's not only boys that are um, um, disciplined through through violence in the home, but 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 it really is in keeping with the point I was making um, in my presentation. These are all um, um, gendered ways in which we, um, we we transmit the idea that um, violence is okay and it's an acceptable means of of discipline and um, and um, and solving disputes. And of course, it has effects because they grow up to then. Um, do the same, which we see in the in the statistics. So um, I agree. 
Thank, th thanks, Corinne. Peter? Uh, yes. Um, yes. The and second question spoke to the fact that the reality that for for many men from boyhood, we are socialized not to express our emotions. So what happens when as adults or even at any point in life, we become enraged or angry? What do we do? Well, unfortunately, we see what happens. The, it, the emotion is expressed as violent behavior very often or in unhealthy behaviors such as substance abuse. I think what, what we have to work on is not only the early stages of, of intervention to help boys and young men learn how to name and tame their emotions, but also teach men that it is something that they can do. Um, there are a number of techniques, stop techniques, um, CBT theory-based techniques that can be used that, that can break that cycle. But unfortunately, if the programming, if the conditioning has taken place from an early age, it may take a while. You know, very often people change when there's something to motivate them. And for some men, it is around having children um, and, and wanting a family despite their abusive behavior. And sometimes that can be leveraged to help them to learn how to press pause, stop, consider alternate choices and make a change. But it's not any magic bullet or, you know, or a simple intervention. It's gonna vary from individual to individual. Thank you, Peter. I'm coming back to an earlier question, and, and Delia, this is for you from Ambassador um, Sumer. You answered, but she asked, she says, as a historian, I totally agree with the historical perspective regarding IPV and GBV, but I think we also need to speak to how women reacted in the face of that violence, not just that there was violence. We cannot leave women in the past just as victims. Also glad to hear that we are no longer shrouding rape as a consensual relationship. Um, and earlier you answered that women were not victims. There is evidence of much agency to change their situations, adapt and revolt. Did you want to elaborate on that point, Delia? Um, sure, very quickly since we in, in the okay. interest of time. But right. I think it's really an important um, uh, point to make and probably even in wrapping up to speak about agency in both historical and contemporary times because um, the issue of reacting to violence as um, Dr. Weller has been speaking about behaviors and so on, the reaction to the violence is very critical. In some cases, it, it really shows um, an ability to survive. And so even the languaging in gender studies has shifted from victim to survivor and that more kind of empowering language. And so historically, there's lots of work that's, that's being done on the ways in which women adapted, women um, revolted, women and even you know those who had access in the households would poison enslavers who were abusive. Um, there's gynecological resistance as well to 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 rape. Um, and so on. Um, but also, I think we have to look at the ways in which behaviors, even in, in our contemporary period, may not necessarily be as positive and are, is part of the cycle of violence. And so in some communities and in some spaces, the fact that a woman may physically fight back at a perpetrator is uh, um, keeping her in that scenario because she doesn't necessarily see it as only abuse, but just a heated sort of relationship where you have, um, you know, fights instead of, of thinking of it as um, person to person abuse. And, and also um, the other point that I was going to make has to do with the agency of, of leaving situations. And, and we would have considered this marinage in history um, enslaved persons running away from various types of abuses. Um, and the fact that persons still today, of course, find ways and means to escape certain um, situations. And of course, through the Bureau and through Women's Inc and so on, having shelters and, and so on to go to. So the, the larger discussion also has to be how are people coping, the coping strategies, the social services that are available so that we don't uh, pigeonhole victims um, as, as that, you know, but as more as survivors and looking at the, the various ways in which they are um, adapting and controlling their own narratives. Thanks, Delia. And I am recognizing Camille Gibson's question, which Corinne has answered. She's celebrating that not all Caribbean men are perpetrators of um, IPV, 
and domestic violence. She's asking what makes them different. And then she's lamenting that violence has had a negative effect on marriage rates in places like Jamaica, which continues to see the divorce rate increase. Karin, did you want to elaborate? I see your answer. Did you want to add anything? No, I don't think so. Okay, so Karin says it's a tough question, but some have the necessary buffers to counter harmful messaging. Very true. I think the important thing for us to note is that the messaging creates an atmosphere ripe for violence. Not all will become violent, but many will. And that acknowledging that her question is critical for intervention. Okay, um, let me just make sure that I have answered all questions. Um, there is a question from Faye. I think Camille Gibson has some comments maybe. And then Faye Williams, how can you address the deeply entrenched cultural values where women, some women, encourage violence in order to validate the care and love of a spouse? Peter, is that a question for you? Not if we only have two minutes left. <laughs> Peter, um, I, it, it, yeah. is, it, is, it is, you know, when yeah. I began it, it, this is about and, you know, yeah. all of these profiles, <laughs> all of these behaviors coexist. Yeah. When we choose to ignore certain profiles and dynamics because it doesn't fit with an agenda, we do a disservice to the social change process. So there are women who don't like to be hit there are women who hit, there are women who think that being hit is love, just like there are men who are diverse. And I think that it's, it's, it's an ongoing conversation we need to have, but we can't have forbidden topics and taboo topics because they don't fit with, you know, um, a personal agenda or whatever. So all of us need help. And as Corin said, and I think a key point here is that I, as a man, will have gotten the patriarchal programming. I will have also have had other programming and other training mm -hmm. with my family, etc. At a given time, one will override the other. Sometimes I succumb to some patriarchal beliefs and sometimes I'm able to challenge them and move beyond them. I grow and I learn. The more we can do as a society to help people to continue to evolve while acknowledging that their past, their history is still present and may still affect them, the more likely we are to facilitate change. So it's a process of and. A lot to consider, creating spaces where we can consider all these different issues and keeping our minds open to looking for the best way forward. And I'll close with that comment. Okay, so that was your closing comment, Peter? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, because ma I was about to, to ask um, all of you to, in in no more than a minute, make your closing um, statement. You know, so Delia, is there? What is that one takeaway that you want us to um, to, to take away? And similarly, Corin and Sharon, Peter, if you can think of anything else while they are, you just come right back. But I, I mean, before you do that, I just want to thank you all again for what I think has been a very rich. Um, um, uh, uh, panel discussion today. A lot of issues raised. We've recognized the complexity of this issue and the tremendous amount of work that we all have to do to, um, to, 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 to eliminate or to reduce, to eradicate intimate partner violence. I mean, uh, Peter, you have talked about the importance of research I mean, I was just, you know, um, noting the collaborations, the coordination needed, you know, the, and, and not just providing research, but as you say, also having the persons who use the research in conversation with the researchers who give the, you know, provide the data and so on. That collaboration, I think, is weak up to this point, and we absolutely need to strengthen, to strengthen. So let me not take away, Delia. Please, you have your one minute, then oh. Carl, then Sharon. And Peter, if you have a 30 second, please feel free to do so. I was gonna say, um, Dr. Weller's closing remark um, is quite apt. I don't need a whole minute. Um, just to say that in the same way I ended my own presentation, these are not private matters. And it's, it's wonderful that these public conversations and public engagement um, are happening more and more so that we can actually get to the various routes and uproot there in order for lasting behavioral change. 
Thank you, Delia. Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to hammer home my point that um, I think that we, I, I just want, I would like us to, to encourage us to, to keep um, work more on, on these issues in very, in um, multidisciplinary ways. Because I think we have a tendency to, um, to address um, this problem more than most, I think, um, uh, within our disciplines, you know, the, the um, criminologists um, um, attacking it in one way, the gender specialists in another, the psychologists in another. Um, and it doesn't seem to, um, we don't seem to be bringing about um, a, re a reduction. Um, I just think I'd like to encourage more um, multidisciplinary um, approaches to the, um, to the study and, and intervention based work as it relates to um, intimate partner violence. Well, all kinds of violence to be yeah. honest. That's a really very important point, you know, the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary work needed. Thank you. Sharon? Oh, first of all, I want to say that the recognition of this issue is very important. And I laud the, the persons who actually came up with the idea to have this conversation. Gender discourse, gender conversations, and so on are very important because they allow you to unpack issues and to talk about it and to have a range of strategies that can be garnered and that can be brokered. It allows for cohesion, um, coordination, promoting voice and agency to have budgets in place so that we can have strategic positioning for a huge takeoff for developmental um, you know, relevance and just to make sure that we are matching what is required. Those are my few words. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> and Peter, the, the 30 seconds, if, there, if you have anything else to add. There's an there's a acronym called VUCA, Vulnerable, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. Those are the times we live in. We're vulnerable, it's uncertain, it's complex and ambiguous. And if we don't get our acts together, we are going to be pushing against uh, a series of problems that um, will be insurmountable. So thanks again for having us all together. And I hope these conversations can continue um, as they are so well needed. Thank you all. Thank you very much, um, panelists. I mean, I'm giving you a clap from my, from my house, you know, thanking you. Uh, There's so many persons who have said it's been an excellent webinar and are thanking you all for sharing so much. Um, D Chambers is saying, well done. Richard from Salises is telling us that the recording will be available on the Salises Mona YouTube channel. And he, he gives us the link and he says to subscribe to the YouTube, YouTube channel. All Salises webinars are uploaded to that. Um, Cheryl Morris Francis is saying, rich information, thank you. So colleagues, thank you. Audience, thank you very much. There, there are how many of you? 46 of you who have remained. So our numbers are down to 53, but we went all the way up to 87, I believe, or 88. So we thank you for staying the course, for, um, for, for uh, attending what is, as Peter and Corinne and Delia and Sharon have said, a very complex issue worthy of a lot of discussion and collaborative work and of the researchers and the practitioners and the legislators working together. You know, Peter, as you spoke, I thought of that concept of join up government, joined up where the, all those boundaries and barriers have to be dismantled and we have to be able to, you know, talk um, with each other, you know. So thank you again. Um, colleagues, this was an excellent, I think, uh, even, evening, an evening well spent, and we close off at this time. Thank you very much. Good night and goodbye. Or thank you so much, Heather. Thank you. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.